Well, hi everyone. Today I've got with me uh, Ian Watson. So for those of you who don't know Ian, he's one of the leading teachers of the principles of Innate Health in the UK and has taught resiliency and well-being programs to business leaders and the staff, teachers, healthcare workers and other professionals in the UK and overseas. Ian is a faculty member of the Innate Health Centre in London, delivering well-being and resiliency programs to school children of various ages. Ian's best teachers are his own two children. So welcome, Ian. Thank you, Rani. Pleasure to be here. Well, lovely to have you here, Ian. So Ian, today's topic, um, I wanted to, today's topic of discussion to be about parenting and, and about um, how, can, how can we help kids be resilient. So what do you have to say about this, this topic as a starter? Yeah, I think it's, uh, first of all, I think it's a hot topic that's on a lot of people's minds. There's a, there is an increased awareness about uh, the necessity to look after children's mental health and uh, emotional well-being. You know, it's becoming much more uh, talked about subject. But I think very often when we talk about resilience, people think of it Think of it as something that we have to instill in children. You know, we've got to put it into them somehow, rather than recognizing that actually they have it already. It's something that is innate, um, no matter what difficulty the particular child might have been through or been up against. Everybody's born with uh, innate resilience. That, to me, is the most important starting point to recognize that. And then the question is, well, it doesn't look like that. You know, how, how come that some children seem to display more resilience than others? Um, and by resilience, I'm, I'm talking about a kind of twofold uh, quality, really, of being uh, resilient in life in the sense of uh, being able to handle challenges um, as and when they come up, um, being able to handle new situations, and so forth, but also being able to bounce back from difficulty and adversity. So I think all of that is included under the heading of resilience. And, and yet what we see is that some children seem to do better than others in these settings. You know, if there's exams coming up, some kids will get really stressed out, others won't. Some might even look forward to it. Um, and similarly, you put um, three children through a, a, a difficult period, some, something that they experience as stressful, Maybe two out of the three will bounce back very quickly and the third one might struggle, you know, and, and you might even look back and say, that was a turning point for them. You know, something since that time, something's been playing on their mind, been getting them down. So for us, what it, what's helpful is, is for us to understand what's going on uh, psychologically and emotionally. And it's actually a lot simpler than we think. Uh, it can start to appear complex, but actually underneath that, it's actually quite simple. It's quite straightforward. But I think the most helpful place to start from is to recognize that all children do still have resilience inside of them. And we just need to understand uh, what's happening for that child psychologically, which makes it look like they might have temporarily lost it. And then once we understand that, we can uh, guide them appropriately. We can help them. We can also model ourselves. We can show them what resilience looks like because it's no different for adults, actually. It's exactly the same. Hmm. Thank you. So, and uh, I'm going to ask you questions. I obviously know what you're talking about, Ian, but uh, um, for the benefit of uh, people who might never have come across something called innate health, something called innate resilience, they might be skeptical. They might say, this looks like a good idea. Hmm. Um, yeah, it would be nice to think that my, uh, my child or every child because we're talking about children, every child is resilient. But hang on a minute, there are kids with problems, there are kids with a diagnosis of um, ADHD, um, mental illness, and you know, people, even some children are unfortunate even to have um, diagnosis and, and uh, uh, symptoms which feed the diagnosis of autis autistic spectrum disorder. And they, are, they, will, they will be displaying the behaviors um, of the diagnosis. Um, what do you, how then can you give a message of hope to, um, to people, uh, or parents of, of children who have got, uh, clearly they have got some big challenges um, on, the, on the plate? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think the first thing is, is just to acknowledge that all of those 
examples that you gave and many more of, uh, yeah, you're right, diagnosable conditions even or just uh, behavioral disturbances and so forth which show up in children. All of those, I could find you examples, as I'm sure you could, Rani, of children who've struggled with exactly the same thing and you know what, they came through it and they came out the other side and they're fine now. They're doing just great. So that's the first thing to recognize is that there's many, many examples of uh, individuals who have struggled, sometimes for a long period, but they've regained their well-being and they've gone on to live um, beautiful lives. So if it's possible for, for one, it's possible for others. Now, the other thing to look at is that even a child who, let's say someone who's, uh, maybe you've got a child struggling with self-esteem issues, self-confidence, something like that. And it starts to become the way that they look, they think about themselves. And maybe other people start to think about them that way too. You know, I've learned when I, when I work in schools, uh, I have to be careful what I take on from the teachers because uh, although it's very well intended, the teachers will often start to tell me about who are the problem children or, you know, the ones that I can expect maybe to be so shy they're not going to say anything or, you know, they, they've got an idea in their mind as to what this child typically is or how they show up. And what I've learned is that very often if, if we can find a, a different way to connect with that child and to relate to them and to help them to see a possibility for themselves, then uh, we can start to evoke the resilience. We can start to evoke the well-being which is there. And it might be just in little areas, first of all. But, you know, even a child who's, let's say, thinks of themselves as someone who's very shy or um, self-conscious or whatever, there'll be moments when they're not. You know, there'll be times maybe they're just hanging out with their best friend, they're feeling at ease within themselves, and they show up completely differently. And then they, you know, when you put them back in a school situation or maybe a home situation even, they revert back to the habitual way of being. But this fact that we can go in and out of different behavioral states, different psychological states, different moods, in a way is proof. It's proof that we are not, uh, these diagnoses and these behavioral conditions, they're not fixed. They're not as solid as, as we think they are. And it's... It's a way of being in the world which has been acquired. It's been learned. And anything which has been acquired can be unlearned. It can be let go of. That's the way I see it. Beautiful. Thank you, Ian. Um, a quote by Dr. Bill Pettit comes to mind um, about, about diagnosis. And I truly believe in this as a, as a psychiatrist myself and having, having seen people with all sorts of uh, mental health conditions and, and labels. And Dr. Bill Pettit says, um, diagnosis um, is, I can't remember exactly what the, the quote is, but something about a diagnosis doesn't uh, indicate who you are or who the, uh, who the person is, it indicates uh, where the person is at that moment in time. And I think it's very, very important because the last thing, um, that the last impression we want to give people is they are their diagnosis. And, and, and that's the worst thing we could do to a child. Oh, you are, a, you, you are an ADHD child. Yeah. And can you see that how, yes, they, they, you know, they, he, that a person, that the child could be displaying symptoms that you could put together and say, okay, this, this fits, seems, you know, this fits the diagnosis of ICD according, um, uh, of um, ADHD according to ICD-10 or DSM-5. Um, and and that, 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 could be, that could be part of the picture, but there's no way that we, you know, the, the, the worst thing we could do is then say, this is a label, you have to live with it for the rest of your life. This is who you are. Because then you'll see that the, all the self-doubts that a child might come up with say, oh, but I have no choice. I have ADHD. And, and, and so it's very, and, and then no wonder they'll be looking out and saying, you I'm helpless. Uh, I can't have help or I can't have resilience. Or even the, like you said, the teachers or the, par uh, you know, the parents could have the same thing about the child in a very innocent way. Oh, bless them. After all, they what 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 else you know and, and it's very easy to then look at the weakness and try to fix the weakness say oh we are going to help you we are going to help you or don't do that you can't do that um this is how you need to do it and and all out of love all out of um really wanting to care for the child really wanting to get give the child the best um we can also um rather than shining the light and say this is you know you have power you have resilience you don't have to believe your thinking for example 
um, we might be saying that you know you you are broken in a, in, a, in a way and we are going to fix it for you can you see can you see the difference that's it and it's so powerful and you know it, it seems like uh to some when people first hear this around it it can seem like well you know that's just semantics or you know we're just splitting hairs or but actually it's fundamental and i've seen the huge difference it makes when you know if i if i can only see as you say the label you know i can only see what's wrong with somebody then that is literally what i see that's what shows up in my experience and it and the fact that i see the person through that filter seems to confirm to them that it's true <laughs> it's like the more that I, I kind of look at them as if they are this person, this child who's, you know, damaged or broken or whatever, uh, the more it seems to confirm that that's true. But it only takes for someone to see through that, kind of to see beyond that label and to see the well-being, the intrinsic well-being, which is still there. And as soon as somebody has eyes for that and starts to uh, recognize that in an, in an individual, it's as if it, it kind of wakes it up in the person themselves. They start to see it as being possible for themselves as well. Um, and, and, you know, and anyone can bring this, this gift to their children. It doesn't have to be a professional like yourself or myself, uh, Rani. You know, if you've, if you've got children or if you're fortunate to be working with children in any sense, um, then you're in a privileged role. And as part of that role, we can bring this understanding and we can start to see well-being on behalf of the children who can't yet see it for themselves. Yeah. It's, it's almost like we, you know, we are the reflecting mirror for them. And it's really important that we recognize it first. So we have to see that as a possibility and, if, and we have to see it as a reality in them. Um, once, we start, once we start to see it for them, they start to see it for themselves. I've seen it over and over again, as I'm sure you have. Yeah. yeah. It's... Um the next question that, that comes to mind, Ian, is uh, there are lots of uh, parenting books out there. Uh, and also about, um, I recently saw a fly about um, how to teach your child resilience and learn a few steps, uh, seven steps and five steps and, and, and so on. So um, there are lots of tools and techniques out there. And um, some aimed at, at, at the general population, like uh, you, you and me, and um, and, and sort of self-help, uh, you know, books and so on. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, some um, some tools and techniques um, that people think that might be relevant for children. Um, for example, um, mindfulness techniques in schools and, and so on. So tell tell us. How do you see this understanding as different to um, useful techniques like mindfulness, for example, which has now been also, um, my understanding is some schools have introduced mindfulness to classrooms um, and, and, and to students and to um, teachers. Yeah, it, it has become uh, quite widely um, recognized as something which is helpful. Um, again, both for adults and for children. I think the main difference with uh, what we're teaching, what we're pointing people towards, is that first of all, it's not technique based. It's not dependent on that child having to remember to do something on a daily basis. Uh, we're not saying that um, you have to do anything in order to uh, attain well being or peace of mind or whatever you want to call it. What we're saying is that that's your natural state. Now, it might be that a, a technique like mindfulness, it might help you to reconnect to your, to your natural state. Um, but actually, what I found is that people generally have things already in their life that they know that these are the things that they, it naturally occurs to them to do just to help them to settle down. So one child, it might be sports. You know, when they go and do sports, they forget about exams. They forget about, you know, that kid who was saying nasty things about them because they just get lost in the game and they love it. And that to me is, is, is fulfilling the similar function for someone else. It might be that they sit quietly and, and meditate or reflect or listen to music or something of this kind. All these things, really what they're doing is they're helping the person's uh, habitual thinking just to settle down enough so they can reconnect to the, the essence of who they are. And whenever we reconnect to who we are on the inside, we feel fine. We feel okay again. We, we know that we're okay. We know that we can handle life. We know that um, things are going to work out. Um, when our mind gets too busy, then we start to lose sight of that. 
So when we've got a lot on our mind, and this is true, as true of, of youngsters as it is for adults, as soon as we start to have a lot on our mind, so we're thinking a lot about the future, or we're still dwelling on things from the past, and it's contaminating our experience of the present, then that starts to create stressful feelings for us, which can easily become habitual. You know, it becomes our habitual way of being. And what we're innocently doing, we're using this gift of thought to create an experience for ourselves which is stressful. And because we don't see the thinking that's behind it, we tend to assume that the stress is coming at us from somewhere else. And it looks to us like it's connected to external circumstances or the situation that we're in or the test that we've got coming up. Uh, and then it looks like we've got to do something about that. <laughs> you know, if that looks like it is the source of our stress, then we've got to put our energy out there to try and mitigate it somehow. Uh, and that tends to perpetuate the cycle. As soon as we start to see that actually stress feelings are, are only ever generated on the inside, uh, they can't be generated any other way. And the proof of that is that you can, you can expose you know, any number of individuals to the same stress factor, so-called, and they won't all feel equally stressed. Some might, might be very stressed, some might be moderately stressed, some won't be stressed at all, some will even say, well, it's fun, you know? <laughs> so it can't be that what we think is causing us to feel stressed actually is doing so. It just, it's, this is a kind of illusion. It's an optical illusion of the way that our experience gets created. And that's what we're helping people to see. We're helping them to understand how their psychological and emotional experience gets created on the inside. Once they understand that, they automatically start to orient themselves in the direction of health and well-being, in my experience. It, when, as soon as you start to realize, oh, I've been stressing myself. I didn't know it. It wasn't deliberate. Nobody does that deliberately. But as soon as you start to see that it's me doing it to me, you tend to stop doing it pretty quickly. And, and then it becomes like a learning curve. You start to see other areas where you've been upsetting yourself, frightening yourself, disturbing yourself, distressing yourself. You say, wow, it works across the board. It works for all the feelings. <laughs> um, but also it works for the good ones too. You start to see that um, you might have attributed being happy or you know, feeling confident to something or someone outside of yourself. You know, I can only be happy when I'm with this person or when I'm doing this activity or, you know, when I'm, I, I, I enjoy this lesson, but I can't enjoy that one. You know, this kind of thing. Um, you start to see that that too is determined by your state of mind in the moment. And that state of mind is a variable. And that as soon as you start to see that, it becomes negotiable. So that you, it opens up a possibility that you could enjoy something that you thought wasn't available to, to you to enjoy. And equally, you start to see that uh, you don't need to have certain circumstances be a certain way in your life in order to feel okay, in order to feel happy. Um, once children start to understand this, and in my experience, they understand it quicker than the adults generally, once they start to see it, they realize that they don't actually need a technique. You know, it might have been helpful for a certain period as a reminder, but it doesn't, it just, it won't make sense to them to continue to do something once they see they don't need it. Yeah. So it might be a helpful stepping stone, but what we're helping the, the kids to understand is that actually they already have whatever it is that if they think they're going to get through doing the technique, they already have it. And once they start to see that and understand how it, how it is that it appears to come and go, but it's not really going anywhere. Once they understand that, they kind of know where to look for themselves. You know, they, they start to learn what they can do that's helpful for themselves and also what they can stop doing that wasn't so helpful. Absolutely. And I've, and I've seen this in my, in my own life with my own children and also people, people I'm, I, I'm um, helping out with. Um, it's something about doing, isn't it, Ian? Because we are so used to doing. Uh, I used to, again, um, my background used to be um, alongside psychiatry. I used to do lots and lots of different um, tools and techniques, and I was even uh, training people in, in, in a specific tool. Me too, Rani. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and the thing is that um, I, again, as a, as a psychiatrist, I, uh, I do think tools have a role. 
especially if people are extremely distressed and you know if you want to uh, protect them from um, doing harm to themselves or to others and you really need something yeah by all means use a tool if it's if it's okay um, and so I'm not going to say stop doing tools but um, but what I've realized in my in my own uh, journey and my own growth is that tools are still you know trying to almost like put a plaster and say you know quick fix stuff and, and like for example i give an example of um if i'm having a a, a very severe, severe headache and i do any go go and attend an important meeting and i'm thinking no this this headache is distracting me i am going to use paracetamol for example and i see paracetamol as a tool and, and i know i'm not going to sort of keep using them uh, but for the time because i just need to uh, sort of um show up because I have something very, very important. I have no hesitation in, in using that. Um, so uh, just, just, just a, a small example, but I want people to know that we are not saying don't use tools or don't use techniques or don't use mindfulness and don't go to, you know, sort of don't go and do something to, to feel better and, and, or to sort yourself out. We're not saying that at all. What we're saying, we're showing, or what we're pointing people to is a deeper understanding yeah. A deeper understanding of where our experiences have come from and, and uh, why even the most scariest of feeling or most uncomfortable feeling or most uncomfortable, you know, scary thought or insecure uh, thought or any, anything that you feel, I need to fix this or get rid of this, um, you know, they are not harmful, they are not dangerous. Uh, and unless we act on them and put life, life, life into those thinking, you know, it's really, it's really not dangerous. And even if if people were to sort of feel okay with any sort of alien experiences they are having, and not make that mean a certain way, or that they they have to act on this, um, we will see much less suffering in the world, and especially in the world, in, in my practice in in mental health field. Do you do you uh, agree with that? Totally, Rani. Yeah. And I, I, like you, I never tell people to stop using anything that's helpful for them. You know, I, I say, as long as it's helping you continue and you will know when you no longer need it. That's, that's the way that I, I say that to people, whatever it happens to be, you know, in, including medication or any kind of technique or practice, you know, if they, if they're doing something or using something, which is, it's helping them to function in the world. Um, then I say, continue for as long as you need it. But I'm going to share with you an understanding which once you understand this, your general level of well-being is going to rise. And you're going to, have, you're going to start to have insights into what's creating those stressful feelings in the first place, once you, which is kind of further upstream. That's where we're pointing people. Yeah. You know, rather than just tackling it at the end when it's already happened, you know, I'm already feeling stressed. What do I do about it? <laughs> but, you know, it's natural, of course, that we, we want something, as you say, like a quick fix. We just want to feel better. That's what everybody, every human is looking for. But as soon as you start to go a little bit further upstream, you start to see what that feeling is actually being created by. And as you say, it's a thought creation. We start to understand the role that thought plays in creating our experience. Just catching a glimpse of that is enough to really, really help a person to settle down in, internally because they start to see, well, what is a thought? It's just a transient, momentary uh, manifestation of some kind of invisible energy. You know, we, we can't grasp it. It's, it's an intangible thing. And yet it has this uh, effect of um, activating our sensory system and giving us a, a whole body experience. So it feels to us like a reality, but as soon as you start to see, actually, it's only real as long as I think, it, think of it that way. And as soon as my thinking changes, I feel different, even though my circumstance hasn't changed. So as soon as children start to understand that, then they can learn to just to write out feelings that, that they might have considered to be stressful or frightening, uh, which is actually what they used to do as babies. You know, young babies have the full range of, of emotion. They get frustrated, they get really upset, they get really frightened. But because they're not giving any extra meaning to it, they just feel it and let it go. And then they're fine again. <laughs> and what's nice is that, that that starts to become available for the older children and the adults. As they learn this, they, they become more like they used to be as youngsters. They start to see they can feel it and let it go. And it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. And, and your intrinsic well-being was not touched by it. Yeah. And not just babies, isn't it? Even with very uh, young children. And yeah. I 
we have a six-year-old, so you you must must have noticed with a six-year-old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the the recovery period is so much shorter with the youngster because they're not adding anything to that experience. Yeah. They haven't yet learned to judge it, analyze it, make comparisons, to wish it wasn't happening, you know, to wonder what they need to do to get out of it. All of that is additional thought that we've learned to to do. Uh, when, in the absence of all that additional noise, the system self-corrects. You know, we're designed to self-correct. It's just to me, it's just like when you when you overexert yourself physically and your heart rate speeds up and your respiration rate speeds up, you don't have to do anything to make that slow down. As soon as you stop doing whatever you were doing that was making it elevate, as soon as you stop doing that, it self-corrects. Yeah, your breathing automatically slows down. You don't have to consciously make it slow down. You don't have to consciously make your heart rate slow down. Well, to me, it's just the same with thinking now. So our thinking can get revved up when we start to feel stressed and worried and anxious or whatever. But if we leave it alone, it's going to just clear out and settle down by itself. That's the, the key piece that people very often misunderstand is that we think we have to do something with that thinking. Yeah, that's when we, we go for a technique or we think there's something that surely I need to do something with it. I need to manage it somehow. Can you teach me stress management? <laughs> I say, well, I could, but I'd rather teach you how not to create it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs>